Welcome to today's session, uh, Breakout 2A, ESG Integration and Sovereign Bond Analysis. Sovereign bonds are an asset class within the fixed income uh, markets where ESG incorporation is often tends to be underestimated. And today we will explore together what are the reasons behind this and how this can change. My name is Carmen Nuto. I am the head of fixed income at the PRI and I will be moderating today's session. Next slide, please. Um, today's agenda uh, is the following. I will set the scene very quickly, giving you a bit of background about ESG integration and fixed income in general. I will then be joined by two market experts um, in the discussion, and we will focus uh, specifically on sovereign debt analysis. And at the end of the session, there'll be time for you uh, to ask questions. Uh, please start posing them through the chat box. Uh, even during the session, we'll try to address as many as possible, uh, even as we get on. Next slide, please. Uh, so th there are several reasons why ESG integration in the fixed income asset class has taken longer to be embraced relative to uh, equity investors. First of all, the asset class complexity. When we think of fixed income instruments, um, we have uh, instruments with different maturities, different coupons, different structures, unlike in the equity world. Uh, also, the fact that bondholders do not have natural channels to engage with companies such as voting rights, for example, as act as a deterrent uh, to uh, ESG consideration in the asset class. And there is much limited uh, research, both academic and market research in this space relative to the equity world. Next slide, please. However, this is changing very quickly, um, especially in the last five years, we've seen the interest by fixed income investors for ESG integration and incorporation picking up very rapidly. This is due to a number of reasons. First of all, uh, being worried about downside risks, um, there is growing appreciation among bondholder investors that ESG factors can impact um, bond valuations and pose downside risks. Uh, also, client demand is increasing quite rapidly. Um, many of our signatories that are pretty advanced in, um, uh, in the process of uh, ESG integration are actually also appreciating that there are opportunities uh, to be spotted um, in this market segment. And uh, it's not just the, the level, the risks that are important, but also the trend um, going forward. And so it's important to look at issuers that are making an effort uh, to change business models or growth models towards a more sustainable uh, trajectory. And finally, there is also a um, different perception about fiduciary duty uh, that is gradually changing and an appreciation that uh, being stewards of clients' money means also uh, being careful about the impact that investment decisions have uh, on the environment and on the planet. And definitely, at least here in Europe, we're seeing a very rapidly changing regulatory landscape, which is also acting as a main driver um, for these considerations to be taken more seriously and more systematically in the analysis. Next slide, please. So when we think about risks for fixed income investors, there are several. Inflation is dominant. Policy rate changes by central banks is definitely a major factor in bond pricing. But credit risk is perhaps the area where it's easier to conceptualize the integration of ESG factors. So environmental, social and governance factors can alter the probability of default of an issuer and affect bond performance. And this is the area where fixed income investors have so far focused the most when it comes to ESG consideration. Next slide, please. Uh, so I spoke earlier about the importance of risk management and definitely um, investors are, are beginning to appreciate um, more and more that uh, a more holistic approach to risk assessment, including ESG factors as a complement to the additional financial analysis, is uh, uh, improving and enhancing the risk return uh, type of um, uh, dimension. But it's also true that in addition to measuring what ESG factors um, risk, that what 
what risk ESG factors can pose to um, the individual issuer assessment or issue assessment or the portfolio assessment. Uh, investors need to be uh, also more mindful of what is the impact that their investment decision may have on the environment and on societal outcomes. So in this um, diagram here, I've uh, uh, put a third dimension, I've called it the three R's, because in addition to risk return, uh, it's also important to think about the real world word outcome, as we like to um, talk about it at the PRI, meaning investors need to be more conscious of, uh, of whether their investment decisions are having a positive outcome on the environment or on society, as well as how they can contribute to reducing negative outcomes. Next slide, please. So at the PRI, we've been working now for a number of years uh, on fixed income and the uh, work streams uh, that we're focusing on has been expanding over time. Here you see a snapshot of the four main ones on which we're currently working. We have the ESG and Credit Risk and Ratings Initiative, which focuses specifically on credit risk and has uh, and sees a large involvement of credit rating agencies um, in this field. We're also focusing on sovereign debt. And as of this year, we've launched two new work streams on sub-sovereign that and securitized products. Next slide, please. Uh, today's focus, as I said at the beginning of the session, is going to be on sovereign debt, um, an asset class that uh, where ESG consideration is often overlooked or underestimated. Last year, we published the first guide on ESG integration in sovereign debt, where we listed many sources and indicators that have traditionally been included in sovereign debt analysis and perhaps not been labeled as such. We've also described a variety of techniques that can be um, used to incorporate incorporate more systematically ESG factors in the analysis, and we published 17 case studies that I encourage you to take a look at if you're new to the subject. Next slide, please. But perhaps the area which is the most challenging in sovereign uh, in integrating ESG factors and sovereign data analysis is engagement. Uh, we are in, in the final stages of the publication of a new report that will probably come out in the next couple of weeks. So I encourage you to look at our website and uh, and um, read it when the report is out. And but we'll give you an appetizer today uh, during the discussion. So I'm very happy uh, and delighted to introduce you to the two speakers that are joining me today. Next slide, please. Uh, with whom I will discuss um, in many uh, challenges, but also uh, drivers behind sovereign um, um, debt analysis and how ESG factors can be integrated in it. So I'm very um, uh, delighted to introduce you to Caroline Lemo, who's head of ESG research, engagement and voting, Adam Mundi, and Jeroen Verloin, who's senior investment manager at BGGM. Um, welcome, Caroline, and welcome, Jeroen. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, I would like to keep today's session as engaging as possible, so I need your contribution as well uh, and, and your input to guide the discussion. So before I give the floor to Caroline and uh, Jeroen, I'd like to pose um, a question to you. So if we can have the next slide and start the poll, please. Um, I would like to ask the audience, what do they think is the main challenge in sovereign bond ESG integration? So is it difficult to price ESG factors? Is it issuer engagement that is the most difficult aspect? Is it the lack of data? Or is it the understanding you find it difficult to understand the materiality of ESG factors in the sovereign space? I've listed the options in alphabetical order, not to uh, be biased, but uh, please start. I can see you've started voting already, which is brilliant. Keep um, sharing your opinions. That would be useful to inform our discussion. So we can probably leave another 10 uh, seconds and then we can stop. If you haven't voted yet, please do so. Okay, great. I think, thank you, Richard. I think we can stop the uh, poll now. And let's see what the audience uh, thinks. So, uh, 
Well, the, the, I can see the opinions were almost fairly evenly spread. So 36% thinks that it's difficult to price. Oh, it's still changing. 40% is difficult pricing ESG factors, 40% issuer engagement, 36% lack of data, a bit of everything, really. Um, so, Caroline and Jaron, what, what, what would have been your pick and what do you think of these results? Uh, it's a little bit of uh, of all the four, I think. Um, the thing is, uh, the the very the thing which is very specific with the sovereign uh, ESG score is that uh, we need it's a little the dynamic is a little bit different from the corporate side. So we um, and when when you are looking at the variety of offering uh, coming for for example the the type providers, um, you will see that is the it's even more different than on the corporate space. So it, there is really something we need to, to first to, to define as an investor uh, uh, when we start uh, doing this ESG uh, scoring is that what is our philosophy? Um, because depending on your philosophy, you will, uh, you will uh, see things different. Do you want to assess how sustainable the, the growth of the country is or do you want to express some values or are you in between? And what is your, do you want to take the, what you call the real, uh, real world outcomes or not? Uh, and do you want to, to, to have a, like a three to, to five years horizon or do you want to, to go further? And this is really something important to fix. And um, the other very specific thing is that there is already some ESG component when you are doing your financial analysis. So you have to be sure that when you are doing your ESG exercise, you are additive to what is already done. And I think it's even more important to be very close to the fund manager and the investment specialist when you are doing your ESG research. Sorry, that, that, that's great. Thank you, Carolina. Jiren, would you agree? Um, or what is your take and how would you comment these results? Well, the, the results uh, validate the value of the paper uh, by the PRI that's coming out as issuer engagement is uh, considered to be the most difficult part. There's also something that we have experienced. Uh, there's not really a framework. Uh, many investors have certain preconceptions about whether you should engage with a sovereign at all uh, uh, because they are sovereign. At the same time, we, we think that it's, it's part of the fiduciary duty that we have. Uh, if your capital is at risk because of actions of the sovereign in, the, in your sovereign bond portfolio, but could also be in your equity or uh, corporate bond portfolio, then that is something to pay attention to. Um, and also in, in terms of the pricing of ESG factors, um, it's also important to take into consideration that this may vary significantly between developed markets and emerging markets, uh, and especially frontier markets. I think data availability becomes very sparse and once you move to uh, lower rated or lower income countries. Uh, so that is something to, to keep in mind as well. Um, and I think the sovereign engagement is, is going to be a very valuable component to uh, like exchange information, to find out more what's happening, to, to, to try to strive for more transparency, but also create in investment opportunities. Because if, if your ESG analysis can uh, identify an inflection point in ESG scoring, then that could be a good opportunity to, to, to get in. Yeah, we will come back to the engagement uh, part because I'd like to spend a bit more time on it since it's um, a, a delicate area, but a very important one. But I would like to go back uh, quickly to one of the points that Caroline has mentioned, that it depends, um, that the ESG integration and sovereign data analysis depends on the purpose and, and what you want to achieve. So it's much more nuanced than it can seem at a first sight. Um, Jerome, you mentioned that there are differences between developed markets and emerging markets. And Caroline also said um, one thing is, uh, you know, just looking at um, ESG risks. Another one is what is the outcome that you want to achieve, which is very important. But also Caroline said something um, 
which uh, I think is often uh, overlooked, that many ESG factors have traditionally been embedded in uh, sovereign debt analysis. Perhaps they haven't been labeled as such. This is not a peculiarity of the sovereign debt market. It, it's been the case, as we found out, also in the corporate debt, in the sub-sovereign debt, for example. But can we expand a little bit about what's already been incorporated and what's new and what is changing going forward? Um, I really think that if you are looking at the governance pillar, um, things are really uh, natural to the uh, cr uh, the analysis you are doing uh, from a financial perspective because you are looking at uh, the government effectiveness, uh, how the institution is stable, uh, you, you look at the economic environment, uh, so you will look at all the, the governance of a country, how the, the institutional uh, institution are working. And this is something which is key to a financial assessment of the risk of a sovereign uh, bonds or debt. And I think this is uh, very natural to a fund manager anyway. Even on the social pillar, I think there is many things that have been already assessed when you are looking at the stability of uh, of a country like uh, uh, the, the 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 education system the healthcare system uh, you know this is something where you it's uh, normal when you are assessing the long term uh, uh, stability of a country to to assess that so there is really something which is already there and the only things I, I, I want to mention is that you can have the same frame, an, uh, analytical framework, but you, I mean, in terms of what you are looking, it, you should, it should be somehow a little bit specific to uh, each country because, you know, uh, you won't look at exactly the same thing depending on the reality of the, uh, of the country. So if I hear you correctly, it, it's good to, uh, you know, have a framework, but also the analysis has to be very specific country by country because these factors may vary. Is that correct? Yes, yes. Yeah. If okay. possible, I think you should have a first uh, generic analysis, but after, if you want to be uh, um, accurate somehow, you really need uh, to make it uh, even further and be specific to the reality of the country and the yeah. dynamic of the country. And, and Giron, you, you work quite a lot on emerging markets. What's been traditional in, uh, uh, in sovereign debt analysis in that market segment? And, and what is new in terms of ESG factors? You're on mute, I think, Giron. Okay, yeah. sorry, I had unmuted myself. Um, That's all right. Okay, uh, so uh, initially, I think most people were just focused on financial metrics. And when it came to governance, it were things like central bank independence, uh, whether politicians would get involved in central bank policy making. Uh, then came the emergence of some data providers, you know, the, 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 the Sustain Analytics or MSCI, and people started to broaden out the scope to some social and environmental factors. Uh, but now you see that all these data sets are, tend to be backward looking. Uh, the data tends to be slow moving. So people are trying to enrich this with higher frequency data. Uh, you, you, there are two well-known providers out there that have provided this. But ultimately, uh, where you can add value is if you start to look at forward looking metrics or do your own research on a country uh, to identify the inflection point. Uh, and also when it comes to engagement, uh, um, road shows, uh, meetings at uh, IMF and World Bank meetings in the spring and the, in the fall are good events, but ultimately most of the questions at such events revolve around uh, what is your policy on FX, what do you expect your FX reserves to be, uh, and there's very little attention at the moment given to questions around ES and G factors, uh, or even uh, let alone how they are progressing on the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and I think that is going to be an important area uh, going forward.
Yeah. And the, 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 before we move on to the next poll, because I'd like to uh, go back very quickly to the audience as well, can you both um, explain your experience in this journey? You know, how, how long did it take you to set up these frameworks and look at ESG factors in, in a more systematic fashion? I mean, the reason why I'm very happy for you both to be here today is because you're very experienced in this field and you've started um, considering ESG factors a long time ago, but this has not been an easy process. Process, I understand, and, and, it, and it's and it's evolving. Could you perhaps share your experience with the with the audience as well? Uh, yes, uh, we start with a uh, uh, first methodology uh, years ago, so quite a long time ago. And this is uh, the, the first uh, uh, start. And we, we after on, based on this first methodology, we we assess what where um how we were conf confident with this methodology and what were uh what was our problem with this methodology uh the the results and uh we we decided to go for a, a, a second version um with a, a different angle and it took us almost uh, one year even more than one year to to settle the second methodology which is not even the our last uh, uh phase but i think this is something we need to go step by step uh uh learning it's a learning curve so we have to start with the first methodology uh, analyze what is uh, right what is uh, less right what is an impact how useful is it for the fund manager um, and then uh adapt the methodology in order to 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 be more accurate and uh, it's uh, all the, the 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 team are learning together, and uh, in order to 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 build a ESG system which is uh, which is accurate for everybody. Yeah, so it's quite an, an iterative process. It doesn't yes. happen over time, overnight. So, Jérôme, would you share that? Have you experienced a similar pattern? Yeah, it's been a very iterative process also as new data sources become available and also as our board of trustee priorities change as well. I think two things that will be very important going forward will be um, we will probably align towards the UN SDGs and we go, we're going to assess how can our sovereign debt investments contribute to those UN SDGs. So how can we uh, invest in certain type of thematic bonds, perhaps by certain uh, countries, to help them finance their progress on SDGs. And the second thing is to uh, to formalize more how we are going to do engagement. So for us as well, uh, we were part of the UNPRI Sovereign Debt Advisory Committee. It's been also a very good process for ourselves to learn from what other people think about engagement. And I think the paper that you are about to publish is going to be uh, quite influential and going to help a lot of investors shape how they think about engaging with sovereigns. Yeah, okay, great. I think we can launch the second poll um, right now. I would, ask, I would like to pose another question to the audience. What do you think are the factors that are most misprized in sovereign bonds? Are they environmental factors? Are they social factors? Or are they governance factors? Um, we, we have alluded um, to some of this during our prior discussion, but I'd be interested in hearing the participants' uh, opinion. Please don't be shy. I can see there are 138 participants online and we have got about 60 people voting, so we can do better than that. Okay. Um, so environmental, social, governance, what are the factors that are most mispriced in sovereign bonds? Okay, I think uh, we give five more seconds and then we can uh, end the poll. Right, let's close here. Thank you for participating. Let's have a look at the results. Um, so I hope the results are not 
changing whilst I comment them, but uh, there seems to be a majority uh, that thinks that social factors are the most misplaced, but uh, with 53% of preferences, uh, but uh, not too far is environmental factors with 45. And I would say personally, not surprising, a minority thinks that governance um, uh, are, are misplaced because perhaps of the three categories, governance factors are the ones that have been traditionally most more embedded in the analysis. Again, Caroline and Giron, what, what, what's your take on this? Are you surprised by the results or how would you have voted? Uh, I think I will a little bit rephrase the question because I think uh, it depends on uh, the question is what is price in uh, in the in the credit price and if you are I mean some things in the social might be already pricing and some other might be not pricing um, I think in the social pillar I will I won't say the global social pillar uh, is already pricing because I think yes the education and healthcare system is pricing maybe uh, the poverty or uh, the, the this kind of thing might be a little bit pricing but you Yes, there are things that are not pricing yet. I think it's uh, uh, there is uh, around human rights and things like this. And on the uh, on the environment, Peter, um, I think that uh, maybe more and more you have some uh, the the physical risks are starting to be priced in because it's quite important. Uh, but if you are looking at the more uh, transition aspect. I'm not sure everything is pricing yet. And you have also all the natural capital, which is uh, not only the climate, you have the nat natural capital angle. And I really see, uh, think that in this, um, water stress might be uh, pricing sometime, but not always. Uh, but definitely the everything linked to the biodiversity loss is not pricing yet. And uh, some other topic as well. Yeah, they, I, I, I think you're very right. And, and, and the more you talk about this, I think, I hope that, it, that the more it's becoming apparent that although the ESG acronym is very catchy, it comprises a variety of factors and dimensions that need to be taken into account when uh, we're building a framework and considering these factors more systematically. But definitely there is more attention to environmental issues, whether they're related to climate change or biodiversity, as you say. And and, and also in, in, I encourage the, the audience to take a look at the report that we published last year where we highlighted that even the categorization itself for your ESG factors can be very flexible and some factors that may be labeled as could also fall under the governance category, for example. Jérôme, of, of the three um, buckets, so to speak, what, what would you think are the factors that are most mispriced um, at the moment? Probably the environmental factor, um, in part also because it's probably uh, the topic we understand the least, and especially when it comes to climate-related uh, uh, events. Uh, for example, flooding risk, uh, the Netherlands is, is quite below uh, the, the, the sea level. Uh, so if there would be flooding risk over time, we, the Netherlands probably has the fiscal capacity to deal with it. But there are many other lower income countries that have the same or even more flooding risk, but don't have that fiscal capacity. Similarly, uh, uh, what is the fiscal capacity of Brazil to, for example, uh, as a sovereign to help the agricultural sector should there be a severe drought? Um, do we fully understand, let's say, if you're investing in Kenya sovereign bonds, uh, what, what is the probability that we're going to see more locust plagues that are going to wipe out, uh, let's say, a quarter of the agricultural industry, which is a significant component of, of domestic GDP? Um, so we, I think there are a lot of these events that are becoming more frequent, uh, creating bigger fat tails, not only in, in the bond prices, because uh, most European pension funds or institutional investors have emerging market sovereign exposure via hard currency bonds and local currency bonds. So the bonds may move little, but the, the uh, currency can actually uh, take a much more significant hit and put a lot more of your capital at risk. So the, given that we don't fully understand a lot of these events, transition risk, fiscal uh, capacity to uh, remediate it, uh, transition risk, um, that is probably the fact the, the factor we uh, we understand the least and therefore is most mispriced.
Yeah, I'm very happy that you mentioned the Netherlands, uh, not least because you're based there, because often when, when we t talk about physical risks or uh, we, we tend to think about emerging markets only, but actually it's also developed markets that are um, affected by them. Uh, and we've seen, for example, in Europe over, over time, the number of droughts or, you know, change, sudden change in temperatures in the last two years that has become much more evident and much more uh, tangible in terms of the damages that they're causing to traditional agricultural patterns, for example. And you make sure on a very important point, um, the link to the fiscal um, to, to the public accounts and the impact on the, on the, on the fiscal side because we have to remember that when we look at ESG uh, factors it's not just the profiling of a country on ESG credentials per se but also uh, measuring the fiscal capacity that a country has to address these risks and and that's the main driver uh, when it comes to sovereign bond pricing so it's the it's the focus should remain and and, and remains on on the fiscal on the sustainability of, uh, of the fiscal path and of the growth models of, of the countries that we're looking at. Um, can we spend a, a few minutes discussing the data? Because one thing is uh, the problem about mispricing, but the other thing is also how do you measure or capture these ES and G factors? What are the metrics that you look at and uh, uh, what, what what is uh, easily available in the market and what do you struggle with? Um, either Jérôme or Caroline can take this first. Jérôme, do you want to start perhaps? Yeah, sure. Um, so, so some of the data provides we've used a lot is Sustainalytics, also in part because PGM used to own uh, Sustainalytics. Um, these days, uh, we have four investment teams that we look at, which is one of which is climate, food, water, and healthcare. And they are the teams of the board of trustees. But soon, uh, we are going to look more at the UN SDGs. So UN SDG data is actually uh, quite good by the UN uh, SDSN, the Sustainable Development Network. They have an open source, uh, sovereign SDG data set, which is very good, but it's only updated annually. Um, so you need to enrich that data with your own analysis. Uh, we've also seen two other providers uh, in the more higher frequency data space. One is called V-Risk Maplecroft, V-Risk Maplecroft, and the other is RevRisk. Um, the latter has also been incorporated into one of the major uh, EM sovereign bond index families. Uh, we have our own opinion about uh, whether that is creating some unintended consequences for particularly low income countries. Um, but uh, some of these, even some of these ESG data methodologies have their own uh, deficiencies and uh, need to be updated. So you, you need to always uh, vet every ESG data source yourself and don't take it at face value. Yeah, and, and Caroline, what, what's what's been your experience? Uh, in fact, what we are uh, we 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 take some data from a data provider uh, as an input, and on the top of that, we will uh, do our own analysis based either on this data, but on the uh, on public information, so World Bank source or IMF, and and, uh, and then we will have our qualitative analysis. And I think what Sharm um, said, and which is very important, is especially on the sovereign space, don't take everything on face value because there is a dynamic, you have to assess the dynamic, and uh, the different, even if it's the same, uh, data field, the, the underlying data might uh, be defined very differently from one country to another. So there is all this uh, this uh, understanding of the data, uh, which is quite important. Yeah. The, I, I would say, if anything, compared to corporate bonds in the sovereign space, we have many more data that are comparable because they're produced by uh, national statistical offices or sources like you mentioned, Caroline, IMF and the World Bank. In fact, I encourage the audience, for those who do not know, the World Bank has uh, uh, last year launched an ESG data portal with a wealth of, um, of data and metrics um, across countries that are readily comparable and they're also for free. Uh, so in that respect, that's an advantage compared to uh, corporate bonds where for corporates, the, 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 the comparability of data is much more difficult. But perhaps in the sovereign space, one of the challenges is the fact that um, data are not 
very up to date or they're not very frequent. As Jerome mentioned, that many are annual. So you have to base uh, and, and rest your judgment a lot on forecasts and on the dynamics and the value judgment that you make of the of these data and the projections going forward. It's um, annual and it's lagging. Exactly, so, exactly. Yeah. Yes. It's, so it's not terribly up to date. Yes, yes, absolutely. So that's definitely a drawback. And, uh, and, and, and it really, it's down to the analyst and the, and the knowledge of the analyst uh, about the country um, to make a, a, a fair assessment of what future dynamics may be. Uh, perhaps we can launch the next um, poll right now, Richard, please, um, which is uh, this time focusing on engagement. Uh, 43%, if I remember correctly, among you said at the beginning of the uh, of this panel that you find it difficult that this could be a challenge for uh, integration of ESG factors and sovereign bonds. But when you think of engagement, what are the factors that you think are the main barriers to engagement? Is it because you find it difficult to approach the relevant sovereign officials? Is it the bond holding size? And here what I meant was like, is your bond holding too small or too big? You don't want too much publicity when you engage, for example. Do you find it more difficult in, de in developed markets versus emerging markets? Is it because you're investing in a passive way that you don't think that engagement is important? Or is it because you think it's politically sensitive? And I apologize for for the for being so coincise in the in the answer options but we had a character limit so i couldn't be more explicit but i hope you got um the gist of it and again i uh put the options in alphabetical order not to influence your choices um so i can still i see that uh we have a very engaged audience today and i'm grateful for that um keep voting please we can probably keep the poll open for another 10 seconds and then we can close it. Right, uh, okay, we can end the poll. Thank you, Richard. I'll wait one second. So let's have a look at the results. Um, again, a fair spread, but the majority, oh, I can see the majority thinks that it's politically sensitive. That's interesting. But also um, many with 55%, but about 39% thinks that approaching the relevant sovereign official is difficult, uh, followed by passive investment uh, and uh, bond holding size doesn't seem to be a major issue in this context, and uh, not even the difference between developed and emerging markets. Okay, so Jerome and Caroline, what's your take here? What, what, how would you have voted? Uh, um, I think when you are looking at engagement, especially in the sovereign space, I think there is something, uh, I mean, it's definitely possible. The only thing you have to take in mind because of the political, political sensitivity and uh, the, 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 the nature of, uh, of a country that you always have to, to uh, be respectful and uh, to do it with cautious, and to be in a in a state of mind where you uh, you you understand the constraints uh, of uh, the people you are speaking to, and so it's really important to be in this kind of win win dynamic where you you try to to first. Uh, um, uh, bring awareness or an information. It's really important to to speak with the officials on what our what is the financial dynamic. You know, uh, uh, Jerome was speaking about the the trustees and how the, the and uh, it's really important when speaking to officials in some countries where maybe they don't have the same dynamic as uh, in other countries to explain to you that there is a a, a movement where our, the trustees of the pension funds or even the regulators are pushing the financial community uh, into taking into more ESG when investing. And it's important for them to know for, the, for their own debt, but also to understand what are the, the companies the, uh, which have equities and corporate bonds in their own country, what they are facing if they want to sell themselves to investors, what they have to, what is the dynamic. I, I think it's first something really important. And this is something we can do without having any I mean, it's not sensitive, it's a way. And when it's come to maybe more sensitive subject, 
it's really important to understand what are the constraints and to to find an area of engagement where you know the 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 the, the country will benefit and it, it, it's in line with the, the world bond or the IMF view and that it's a, a common dynamic Great. And Jiran, what, 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 what would have been your choice uh, if you had to vote here? Uh, probably similar to this one. So the political sensitivities and the approach. Although uh, the political sensitivities, I think, is, is in large part a preconception or a stereotype. Um, I understand political sensitivities if you're an official institution like a central bank or a sovereign wealth fund or your pension fund that is under the direct control of your own government, then it could be uh, that you're interfering with diplomatic relations. So that I fully understand. But if you're an asset manager in Europe or you're a normal pension fund or you're an insurance company, then I think it's it's a different situation and uh, the sensitivity shouldn't really play a role. You have to be careful in what you engage with. Obviously, you shouldn't go talk about um, anything around uh, democratic um, relationships or anything around religion. So you need to be very delicate with the subject you pick. But environmental ones are, are quite good to pick. And I think that what this year has been a good example has been Brazil. Uh, a couple of uh, Scandinavian investors and Dutch investors, UK, uh, have come together uh, to approach the Brazilian government about the deforestation. And actually, as a consequence of that, several domestic investors in Brazil and domestic companies have joined that initiative because they're also seeing that what is happening around the relaxation of the forest code, lack of enforcement, uh, that is go going to impact uh, our, your sovereign bond investments, because the currency, uh, Brazilian real is one of the worst performing currencies this year, even worse than some uh, defaulted countries. Um, your equity investments also suffer because of the currency. Uh, your corporate bond investments may suffer. Um, so that uh, that initiative has been quite good. And there is now an invest called Investor Policy Dialogue on Deforestation in Brazil. And I think the UNPRI also uh, was looking to get involved and be a coordinating factor. So so, th so that is something the, the political sensitivities can be dealt with by coming together as a group rather than investors single-handedly doing engagement and having this coordinated by an, uh, a neutral institution like the PRI or the EM Investor Alliance. And when it comes to approaching the relevant sovereigns, uh, I think that is also that is a that's a genuine challenge. I think um, partially because uh, sovereign investor relations are quite nascent, um, but fortunately, uh, this paper by the PRI that's coming out is 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 highlighting the importance of this. Um, the IMF recently wrote a very good paper on uh, sovereign relate investor relations. The World Bank has two papers coming out to help DMOs and ministries of finance to deal with ESG questions and questions in general by investors. And many countries, if you want to have ask questions uh, about a certain country in Southeast Asia or uh, in, in Africa, they don't have a investor relations space. You just, you can't find people to reach out to. You have the IMF meetings or World Bank meetings if one of the banks coordinates an event. Uh, but usually you're, you're constrained to a 45 minute, one hour chat with 50 other people who all ask questions about uh, FX or fiscal balances, and then there's no opportunity to ask E, S, or G related questions, or how are they trying to finance their UNSED progress. So I think those papers that are coming out are going to be this fall, are going to be a huge step forward, and also going to highlight to a lot of asset managers that there is indeed a lot possible, but you need to push. And at the same time, the ministries of finance should understand that sovereign investor relationship is a mutually beneficial relationship. They benefit because they can communicate their policy making, what they are doing, that enhances their credibility and should reduce their borrowing costs. At the same time, for the investor, they learn more about what's going on, they get more transparency, they understand more how their money is being used because ultimately, as a sovereign bond investor, you are underwriting or financing the, the government uh, who then uses this money to spend on healthcare, education, public infrastructure.
Yeah. Before we move on, I'd like to remind the audience that uh, if you want, you can start posing um, questions via the chat room. We'll address them um, 10 minutes before the end of the session, uh, but you can start already submitting them if you want. Uh, going back uh, to what you said, Jaron and Caroline, what struck me were three main points. So Caroline spoke about uh, being delicate and diplomatic when addressing sovereigns, but equally th this should not be the, the fact that um, some issues may be politically sensitive should not be a deterrent for engaging. Um, Giron mentioned the possibility of collaborative initiatives that may um, reduce um, the, that political sensitivity and also it talks about misconceptions around um, engagement which I think is very important and and, and finally um, the, the the type of relationship that you have with sovereign officials can we spend a little bit uh, describing to the audience what has been your experience of engagement and 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 perhaps uh, clarify that when you engage with sovereigns you don't just engage with ruling parties but with a variety of stakeholders to form a view and gather information uh, to make better investment decisions and also to convey your expectations yeah. caroline do you want to start Yes, I think when you're, I mean, this is something very holistic. It means that when you are engaging, you are might be engaging with the Ministry of Finance, but you're also engaging with uh, uh, somehow some other uh, bodies, local bodies, as a, you know, a, a generic, uh, um, how to say, way of, uh, uh, of being an investor, because uh, we are, as an asset manager, we are an investors, and you, we are also uh, sometime member of the uh, financial uh, system, the local financial system, and as such, it's normal to engage and to to have a dialogue with uh, with your, the different uh, body, uh, uh, the, the different authorities. So this is a first thing, and I think I will highlight maybe a, a situation which is around refinancing, and uh, lately uh, we were. In a, in some discussion around that, when there there is a refinancing uh, discussion, there is a moment there where we can really, really have this this discussion, which is more clear, more direct on ESG, and uh, uh, this is uh, uh, a moment where the the discussion is even uh, easier with uh, with the countries because uh, if we we are respectful and we 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 put ourselves in a situation where we understand the constraint of the country and we try to find an area where um, uh, we can find an area where they can improve uh, even with their own constraint, and we understand what is driving their constraint, we can push our ESG agenda. But there, it means that it will be different from one country to another, so it will be specific, and it, 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 it requires us to have do our own due diligence uh, at first, because it means that you, we, we have to find the specific KPIs which uh, will uh will uh, have so, some good value for the country and for us so it's really you made an important point caroline it's not just so much about the engagement but also the timing of the engagement which is equally important and and refinancing it could be a good um uh, a, a good point to um, initiate or um uh, continue a dialogue that may have started earlier. Jiron, what's been your experience um, with engagement? I know you don't engage directly because you appoint your external manager, but how do you monitor what they're doing for you? Yeah, I mean, we, we also have internal teams and they do engage with EM corporates. Um, one thing around the refinancing, um, I think uh, what uh, Caroline, uh, Caroline is uh, referring to is a, a recent Latin America sovereign default, um, where there was uh, some plans which were mentioned in the news to embed certain SDG criteria. But actually in the fixed income market, there is almost every year, uh, every, even every quarter, a refinancing moment. And that is, I think, the beauty of fixed income. Uh, impact investing and uh, use of, good use of proceeds are way more uh, easier in the fixed income world than in the equity world, where you just buy ownership of a company, you buy shares from somewhere else. 
So incrementally financing outcomes, like you put at the, at the start, real world outcomes, is uh, possible in the fixed income world. Um, and also maybe also one thing to mention around the passive investments, uh, about 28% also tick this box. Uh, I think also that if you invest passively, uh, that doesn't relieve you of the fiduciary duty mm. to engage with entities that you invest in, including sovereigns. And I think when investors can come together as a group, they also overcome this bond holding size issue whereby they're sometimes too small. Um, and I think the Brazil example has is, is been a good uh, case because this group has been able to speak to the vice president, has been able to speak to various members of parliament, of, of various ministries, etc. So uh, I think countries are willing to listen. I think uh, it's also uh, about investors just overcoming this uh, perceived hurdle of not of thinking that sovereign engagement cannot be effective. It can actually be very effective. Uh, at the same time, you need to be realistic uh, because it's, it's a big country. Uh, it can have 100 million people, 200 million people. So you're going, not going to change things from one day to another. But uh, protecting your investments and the potential depreciation of it is, is a lot more important. Um, and about stakeholders, I mean, the central bank is obviously a good party, the, uh, the capital markets regulator, uh, especially if you're a local currency investor. Um, that also comes back to refinancing. Uh, uh, a lot of these ideas are coming in the offshore dollar bond world uh, to embed clauses into uh, bonds issued offshore under New York or London law. But um, what is it, the DMO to stop? from actually embedding some of these clauses in their own domestic bonds and foreign investors buying them. Um, if I was a certain sovereign I, I, and I want to enhance my credibility and lower my borrowing rates, that is something to be considered. Mm -hmm. um, and stakeholders as well, um, there can also be stakeholders, uh, so there's a different ministry, there can be a ministry of energy to understand what they are planning to do on the energy transition. Speaking to the Ministry of Environment to understand what they're doing around protected areas, reforestation, afforestation, etc. Um, you could speak to an NGO, uh, and I know that certain asset managers also do that in the country, uh, opposition parties, uh, but also other non uh, country stakeholders like a benchmark provider, ESG provider, to understand what they're doing, but also to challenge their approaches. So it's a much more rounded process, let's say, compared with the equity engagement uh, that people are much more familiar with, our corporate um, engagement, for example. So uh, time is flying, unfortunately. I would like to open um, the floor to, to the questions. Before we do that, I would like to ask one more question, last question, to so the audience to gauge which are the areas on which we should focus on uh, more going forward in terms of um, work ahead. So if we could perhaps, Richard, have the last uh, Paul, please, on the screen. So what, what do you think are the priorities for future work on ESG integration and sovereign debt? Is it, should we prioritize climate change and biodiversity? Should we prioritize DM countries, developed markets or emerging markets? Um, more collaborative engagement initiatives or uh, focus on understanding and pricing social factors. They're not mutually exclusive options, I know, but it's it's uh, it would be great if you can just pick one um, to give us a sense of uh, how we should prioritize future work. Um, and uh, so I repeat one more time, climate change and biodiversity, developed markets, emerging markets, more collaborative engagement initiatives, understanding and pricing of social factors. Apologies for the typo that I can see EM, but it wasn't our fault, unfortunately. Uh, okay, 10 more seconds and then we can probably end the result. And uh, with a huge thank you to uh, the audience who's been very actively engaged. Uh, right, we can stop here. Thank you, Richard. So uh, let's have a look. Um, there is a bit of everything. Many people are asking for more collaborative engagement initiatives. That's very interesting. Understanding and pricing social factors. Oh, no, sorry. The second IS one. Oh, the same. The climate change and biodiversity are ranked uh, similarly to more collaborative engagement initiatives. Okay. Uh, and then understanding and pricing social factors. Um, interesting that only 2% thinks that we should focus more on developed markets and 24% on emerging markets. Thank you for that. Uh, very quickly, Jeron and Caroline, I'm going to ask you one more time, what would have been your, what would have been your choice if you had to vote with the audience? 
That's difficult. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, engagement will, uh, um, it's something definitely quite important. And I will uh, rank also uh, climate and socials uh, being uh, quite important. Right. Um, on the other uh, question, I mean, yes, emerging market countries, the, I mean, seeing the, the ESG, uh, uh, value added is quite, um, uh, straightforward. But I'm just surprised on the, uh, of the pool of the developed market and it answered to one of the questions. It means, yes, there is, uh, I mean, the, 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 uh, the yeah. yield are currently very low. But I mean, over the last decade, we face uh, some uh, very bumpy market with uh, some crisis. And so even in the developed markets, uh, things are not so simple. And so you have the risk-free uh, countries or adapt where, you know, uh, what, uh, whatever, they will always uh, uh, be, uh, uh, be there. But, you know, among the developed markets where you have different uh, reality where some developed market uh, debt has been facing some from time to time quite a big crisis. So I think for them, uh, taking into account ESG uh, uh, could uh, could uh, be quite uh, valuable. Yeah. So I won't be so so systematic. And we are facing some uh, big crisis where I think the answer from one country to another could be different. So okay. I won't be so sure about uh, Thank you. Caroline, sorry. I'm gonna stop you there I'm just sorry. very quickly. No, no, because I want to address uh, the questions from the audience. Jérôme, just in one sentence, what would have been your pick? Would have been your pick here? Uh, the fourth one, more collaborative engagement, right, engagement because right. it's uh, okay. it's a low hanging fruit and it's within our own control. Okay, great. Uh, one of the points uh, that I like to stress when it comes to engagement, it, I, I said earlier that it's important for investors to make more informed decisions, but it's also important for uh, tracking progress for, uh, for that governments are making towards existing pledges, like the Paris Agreement, for example, or the um, SDGs. And in fact, one of the questions from the audience is, uh, uh, is about SDG alignment analysis. Could you elaborate very quickly on how we could do this in practice? Very quickly, because we've got two more questions to address. Thank you. Maybe, uh, yeah, Carol, maybe, yeah, go ahead, Jerome. Thank you. Yeah, maybe on SDG alignment. Uh, so PGM with APG and a few other asset owners have a asset owner SDG platform where they can analyze companies based on how much impact they make on SDGs and how much exposure they have. Uh, but that's only on the corporate world. The challenge is it to get it to the sovereign space. Um, and I think that perhaps the UN SDSN uh, and Bertelsmann Stiftung uh, SEG index is probably the, at the moment the best comprehensive data set on SEG. Um, to, to then look at how much is it aligned, um, your investments, that is a challenging part. And I think that is where thematic bonds can be the bridge towards that. So uh, Egypt, for example, or Indonesia uh, and Chile are probably one of the better structured uh, sovereign green bonds with very clear use of proceeds, very good second party opinion provision, um, very good reporting. And I think that is where you can say, okay, I have invested in a certain green bond. These proceeds are going towards these and these projects and therefore I'm making impact on SDGs. Yeah. Caroline, and uh, thank you, Jeroen, for that. That, that, that that's um, an area that we should expand perhaps more, uh, even in terms of analysis going forward. Caroline, th there is another question. Do you think that divesting is an effective measure uh, to do ESG integrations in sovereign debt? Um, I think it, it, it depends on uh, how, uh, what kind of country we are speaking uh, mm -hmm. with. Uh, if and what is our what we want to do? Uh, if we want to have an impact on the real world, the we have to engage, we have to to dialogue, uh, to make things change, even if it we are just part of the system. Uh, divesting first, it, it won't always be possible because of the uh, risk return profile and the fact that you know at the end of the day you have to 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 build the portfolios. And also, it's uh, it won't, it might not be uh, the, the best solutions to uh, to have an impact on the real world. But again, it really depends of the uh, of the situation because at some point, if the, there is a risk is higher and 
you can't bear the risk you have to divest. Okay, I think that's that's quite important, and it's something that it's a question that is valid across all types uh, of asset classes. Really, is divestment a real solution here, or is it better to engage and accompanying the issuer, whether it's a corporate issuer or a sovereign issuer, in the transition? That's an important question. We have one more question, and uh, um, that we'll try to address separately because time, unfortunately, is um, running out. I would like to first of all thank you so much. Caroline and Jaron for their input has been very valuable and I hope you, the audience has found it interesting um, and that um, it will be a stimulating um, factor for people to focus more on this area. Um, the, I would like also to leave you with three key takeaways uh, and an encouraging, encouragement really to broaden sovereign debt analysis beyond traditional indicators that we've um, uh, heard mentioned earlier uh, today uh, and, and be a bit more creative um, and also look at a variety of qualitative indicators that are coming to the fore that are enhancing the research and the analysis. Uh, also, it's important to develop a more systematic and rigorous approach to ESG integration. Again, many factors have traditionally been embedded in the analysis, but never put in such a framework that will help um, integration going forward and also framing discussions with sovereigns. Um, I think you should not underestimate the importance and, and the key pivotal role that uh, US bondholders, sovereign bondholders can play um, in, in driving change. So rethink your approach to ESG engagement, overcome misconceptions, and uh, as you heard from uh, the speakers, engaging is not only with uh, sovereign officials, but it's about with a variety of stakeholders, including index providers um, and uh, um, ESG information providers as well. So please stay, uh, next slide please, um, stay up to date with um, all our work uh, that uh, will be published on the Fixed Income Dedicated webpage www.umpri.org forward slash fixed income. You can register for upcoming events on our events page that you can see um, highlighted on the slide. And finally, don't hesitate to reach out to us if you have any further questions. Thank you for joining. Goodbye for now. Goodbye. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, Jerome. Thank you.